Zig helped us move data to the edge. Here are our impressions. All right, kicking the tires on Zig with a Greenfield open source project. Our company is a Rust shop. We love Rust and we believe Rust will be the main engine of our work for a lifetime. But as a bunch of performance nerds, we've been keeping a close eye on Zig. It evokes a feeling of simplicity that I long for the C days. Yep, agreed. And comp time, the ability to run arbitrary code at compile time is straight out brilliant idea. Welcome to Costco. I Almost as smart as me remembering to turn off alerts. It, completely agree. So this is why I love the idea of Zig. It has the simplicity feeling of C, but it also has comp time, which effectively you get everything you need out of C++ right there. So I love that idea. Uh, like a shiny new tool, we've been looking for a way to make use of Zig in the shop. Rewriting existing production code really wasn't an option, so we found a new project to give it a spin. This article details our experience. So I think this is pretty exciting. Uh, our product, Terso, if you don't know, I am sponsored by Terso, but I'm reading this article because other people send it to me because it's actually, it's pretty great. So just so you guys know, this is technically not an ad, though it may feel like one, it's not one. Okay, anyways, uh, it's an edge database. If you're unfamiliar with the concept, it's very simple. If you're deploying your code uh, in multiple geographical locations, accessing your data from a central location will make your application slow. You may not like it, but a genius, let's see, but a genius, a couple, let's see, but a genius a couple years ago proved there's nothing you can really do about it. I'm talking about Einstein, not Tom. They know. They know about Tom. That That's pretty good. We already know where the link goes to. We already know where the link goes to. We all know where the link's about to go to. We all knew what was going to happen. What? What a play. Because of the limitations of the physical world, the only way to get super fast database queries in both San Francisco and Sydney is to have the data replicated at both places. Keeping a database running in multiple locations is expensive, which means to make this work, you need a database that is extremely cheap to run. That's why we use LibSqueal, a, an open contribution fork of SqueelLite. Uh, add to that a lot of machinery to make replication simple and easy and automated, and automatically route you to the closest replica and you have an edge database. There we go. Storage costs. Replicating data er everywhere does have a cost. Our reliance on a slim and mighty database helps us to keep the compute cost in check. But for the data, there's not much you can do about it. Want 10 replicas? Pay 10 times the storage. Makes sense. Uh, this works for a variety of applications, especially in the web, where data volumes are low. I have helped design a no-squeal database before, SiloDB, that operates at the petabyte scale. So low and high are always relative. Let's go around with the numbers. Storing a gigabyte of data on fast storage costs less than a dollar per month. Assume 25 cents to leave room for all markups. Storing 10 gi uh, gigabytes of data will cost around $2.50 per region. We support up to 34 regions, so if you deploy into all regions, that's still $85 a month for storage costs. Less than you'll pay for HubSpot, Google Workspaces, or any other SaaS tool that your company depends on. Okay. But even before uh, we reached the petabyte level, there are many use cases we'll accumulate, uh, we'll accumulate hundreds, if not thousands of GBs. And while you may have the money to spare, the reality is that you don't need all the data on the edge. Some of it is just cold and you don't need it all the time. An architecture that takes advantage of the edge while keeping the cost down is one will keep your database of record in uh, a central location and then replicate some of the data to the edge. Clever, right? Pretty clever. Uh, the solution, PG Terso. To tackle this issue, we built PG Terso, a Postgres extension that automatically syncs a slice of your data to Terso. It is completely experimental at the moment and not production ready. We are making progress in productionizing it over the near future. That way it works. Let's see. The way it works is that you're... Uh, is that you choose a table or a materialized view in Postgres that you wish to replicate to the edge. Tables are often already a subset of your data. A materialized view are standard ways of selecting part of your data for certain queries. Our extension then hooks into Postgres local replication and materialized view refresh process, replicating the changes right out to the Terso database. Smart, right? This is actually pretty dang smart. We built PG Terso with Zig. The first reason why we made, let's see, why this made sense is that PG Terso is a very self-contained and isolated project. It does not need to share code with the rest of our database. There's no need to rewrite production code or even take a dependency on Zig. Okay. The second reason was that there's already code in the wild, written in C, that was similar to what we wanted to do. If we could reuse some of that code, that would be a win. Postgres allows users to provide a logical decoding output plugin, which is a fancy name for your own replication routines. Postgres itself already has an example of the plugin to get you started. 
Cool, right? All right. Zig delivers uh, for C interoperability. Zig is famous for its seamless interoperability with C. It even has cross compiler to transform C code right into Zig. Oh, that's cool. I didn't even know that. I have never touched Zig before, and because what could go wrong? So I just tried. <laughs> Which it didn't work at all. Okay, but that was just due to missing headers, and to my uh, slight uh, surprise, Zig Translate include... Okay. It compiled just fine, dumping lots of Zig, valid Zig code. Huh. We still had work to do to make our extension, but that's a start. That's actually, I didn't realize that you could do that. You could just translate C into Zig. You could just like, Zig. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Uh, the next step was to add some definitions about Postgres module. In the test code above was done with a macro, which Zig thankfully does not support. For the Rust people who complain about Rust macros, C macros are straight from hell. <laughs> they are. They are straight from hell. That required a bit of boilerplate code, but still manageable and ergonomic to write. Predictably, we are also going to need a few definitions from the Postgres uh, header uh, interface. Forget binding generators and explicit foreign function interfaces. In Zig, you just slap a, a, a sim port. Ooh, I got a lot of sim ports in the chat. Uh, and call it a day. All the C code available under an isolated namespace. That's actually super cool. I did not realize you could just, you could just sim port and boom. That actually just works. Okay, that's pretty cool. I did not know that about Zig. That it's 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 actually that easy to just just make it happen. That is cool. That is super cool. Uh, the simport directive is based on the translate C, which means that the header is translated to native Zig code during compilation. This is where Zig shines. It seamlessly wraps a C header into a Zig structure as if it uh, as if it yet yet. Oh my goodness, as if it was yet another Zig module. Where's TJ to make fun of me? And you are free to use all constants and functions as if they were native Zig. Truly amazing. This actually is like an incredible idea right here. This is one thing about taking a known language, not deviating far from the syntax or how it works, and just fixing a few small things. That's one thing I've really appreciated about Zig. It's like, if you're going to write C, well, there's a bunch of things in C that kind of suck. Zig is just like, it's really just slightly better C with comp time. That's how I feel about it. It's just like better C. It's like Go, but the harder version. It's just, it's battle toads of Go, <laughs> right? There's, there's, the, there's the easier game. The, you know, Go is more like The Sims and, and Zig is more like battle toads. If C is the father, that's what you get out of it. Uh, go, but hard mode, yeah. Debugging and cross-compiling are smooth. The way Translate C works is that all the dependencies are cooked right into the final file. This means the relevant parts of the C standard library also gets translated and added to the output. That's very convenient because it makes the resulting uh, single source file self-contained. A bonus of this behavior is that debugging deep issues, the kind that always occur when writing system software, is made much easier. All the C dependencies, the C standard library, the Zig standard library, gets shipped as code that gets compiled along with your project. That gives the compiler more opportunity to optimize, inline, and reduce your final binary to only what it needs. But it also means you're free to edit the code yourself if you run into one of those unexplainable issues that could be coming from anywhere, like we did. Huh. Another advantage is that uh, it allows Zig to shine in cross-compilation. In our company, for example, one of the reasons that led us to, uh, to code our CLI in Go is how well it cross-compiles to Mac linux and even windows rust is nowhere near that yeah that's one of the i always hear this as an advantage to go and why i hear a lot of the devops stuff is is that cross compilation is just like top shelf in go uh translate c has some issues with obscure c code a great uh as great as the experiment with translate c was zig had some issues with some complicated macro constructs now say let's see now that say uh that says more about c macros than it does about zig i have mentioned the, how monstrous c macros can be Dude, some of the worst things I've ever had the debug are C macros. You get macros that call functions, that call macros, that call functions, that call macros, that call functions. There was one in Netflix for logging that was so complex, I spent an entire day trying to trace it. I could not figure it out. I could not for the life of me, in eight hours of looking at code, figure out what the hell was happening. It was just too difficult. I hate preprocessor stuff. It is just the worst. 
The main issue is that Zig compiler is not always capable of guessing the types safely. In all fairness, oftentimes with C macros, humans cannot guess them either. But reality is that the world of C is full of those macros. So expect interoperability to fail at times. Fair. The good parts of Rust are here. Judging modern languages like Rust and Zig needs to go beyond the language definitions. The ecosystem matters. Absolutely. It's one of the four axes of judging a, a language well. Uh, the Zig building process is elegant. It, would, it wouldn't... Oh my goodness. And it won't be a surprise for Rust folks that have uh, ever written a build RS script before. Zig is built on similar principles. If you want to state that your code should be linked to the standard C library and compiled to a shared library, you express that in uh, Zig. Yeah, this makes sense. I, I've never, you know, you have to learn a little bit about Zig to be able to build Zig effectively in these larger projects. But to me, that's fine. I'm fine with that. A build system in Zig for Zig, I'm okay with that. Another thing that Rust hackers would admire is Zig format, an opinionated tool uh, for formatting Zig code so that you avoid endlessly bike shedding over code style. I, I'm, a, I'm fine with that. There's something about it, no matter how much I dislike it, which I feel like anytime you get four auto formatters, nobody's technically happy. Therefore, everybody's happy. I kind of like that. Error handling is another ergonomic aspect of Zig. At first, I was really confused when I saw catch unreachable. Yes, idioms all over code samples. But once I understood it, it made perfect sense. It also maps well to Rust concepts. It does very, very well. Functions uh, can explicitly declare if they may uh, rate turn errors. If they do, you can use the try operator inside them, which is conceptually similar to Rust uh, question mark. It is. It's almost identical. It's the only downfall to it is that it's a prefix operation as opposed to a postfix operation. So that means chaining becomes hard. You have to do things like this instead, right? So this just simply means that we're going to format this buff print. We're going to grab some sort of offset, starting from offset all the way through. So we're going to do some sort of slice in here. We're going to take the string null and do something with it. And here's the options we're going to pass in an anonymous empty struct with the default values put in. And then just try that. That means if there is an error, we return the error, else the value will be assigned to nothing. Right? So very, very similar to Rust. Errors are handled by a catch operator. Yep, you can do catch. You can do a little catch error. This is pretty cool too. You can call a function and then call catch and provide a little closure right here effectively. This is a capture group and just say, hey, give me the things. It's pretty nice, right? I'm not a fan of the anonymous syntax struct. Yeah, I, I think that it, it's a little weak. I agree with it, but it works. Uh, and catch unreadable uh, or unreachable is a concept, a uh, twin of Rust unwrap. Yes, it aborts the execution of your program if an error occurs. Yep, that makes sense, right? When an error happens, this should never happen is what you're saying your program cannot proceed. I miss uh, Ray. Zig is very opinionated on explicit is better than implicit. As a consequence, it lacks Rust style uh, destructors. All the allocations need to happen explicitly. The explicit allocations are definitely nice, but it lacks destructors uh, is a mild foot gun. Similar to Go, Zig offers a defer keyword to let programmers create shutdown routines. It's idiomatic to write code like this. Yeah, you see this all the time, right? This is like super common in Zig, which is nice. It just simply means at the end of the scope, we deallocate it. It's effectively like Rust, but you just have to write it. Uh, it's easy to forget and easy to leak memory or hold onto resources. Yeah, if you're used to Rust or a modern programming language, doing this again feels arcane, you know? I obviously do see the flip side of that. Sometimes you're not in interested in calling destructors, e.g. if your program uses arena allocators or creates long-lived objects, which in Rust are a bit painful to write. Absolutely. Uh, still, a person who forgets things, I miss the convenience of default destroy nature of Ray in Rust. Yeah, I completely agree with this. I wish there was a way that you could provide an interface, much like try. You know, try also works this way. I wish there was a way you could, there could be like an auto-destroy interface. Like if you just do, if you implement this, it just automatically does it for you. That'd be fantastic as it goes out of scope. I'd love that. But I can see why they don't do that. They don't like to do anything implicit. Um, using. Yeah, using would be cool, right? Anything inside the using. We need a monad. You could write a macro. You could. Uh, or a comp time thing. Uh, the ecosystem is still maturing. Zig has HTTP and JSON support embedded into the standard library, which when I first did my work with it, it did not. You had to download it. You had to import it. It was not... As nice, which came in handy since Terso is accessible over HTTP. However, a lot of the cool features are only available in dev builds, which daily releases are, and are explicitly described as not mature in their docs. HTTP support was one of them. This forced us to use the newest dev release on our CI, which kept breaking in backwards incompatible ways. Ooh, rough. 
And when we mentioned that having the whole library output the final file was handy for debugging, that's from experience because of an issue with standard headers. We couldn't get replication working uh, terso. Well, we couldn't get replication working terso until it became clear it was an issue with the standard library. We contributed the fix back. Oh, nice. Content length header was inspected by mistake, which makes it effectively impossible to use chunks transfer encoding. Oh, funny. Can't do that. That's cool, though. That's cool that they're patching the HTTP stuff. Chunked, uh, chunked, chunked encoding, you know, sometimes you just got to have it. Kind of annoying, but you got to have it. An experience, let's see, the experience of contributing to Zig was really great. The PR was promptly reviewed and accepted and landed in dev release soon afterward. But at the end of the day, the issue, uh, issue, the, let's see, an issue this central with HTTP headers does show that the language has some, uh, to mature a bit before we can switch our whole company to it. Okay. That's reasonable. All right. The verdict. The overall experience was great. Zig code looks cleaner and Postgres CAPI header is neatly hidden behind a Zig interface. And the standard library support for HTTP and JSON means that we don't need any external dependencies, which has its own value. I do agree with that. Uh, you know, I like the fact that I like when languages just provide the, the things you need, right? I like that. I personally want that. I mean, I know you can do Serde, and then you can do Serde JSON, and then you get it, or you want some other version of a JSON, you can use that as well. But there is something really nice about a language just saying, here is JSON, here's how you decode it, first class experience, that is that. There's something very, I just, I like that experience, okay? So like Python, like JavaScript, well, it better be in JavaScript. Like, uh, not like Rust, though. Rust, you do have to kind of, you know, get your own thing. Uh, despite a couple of rough edges, we remain incredibly bullish about the future of Zig. The future, though, is not yet here. This was a great article. I really, really like these kind of articles because it wasn't too technically deep, right? We're not reading just gallons of code, right? This wasn't gallons of code to be read, but it was perfectly to the point. It highlighted everything I wanted to know about Zig. Because the problem with Zig is that I often build only toy projects. I'm not building something fully, like, must be getting ready to be productionized, meaning I'm making a really long-term bet on it. And so for this, is like a re this is like a really good example of why you can make a long-term bet on it, but you have to know what is happening. And so generally how I, I judge a language is, like, the language syntax itself uh, and then ecosystem. That's really important. And so the syntax itself and how it handles various cases, like it doesn't throw errors. It's just a must in today's languages. I, I hate using languages that throw errors at this point. They're just so prone to the most thorny things. And the one good use case is a global catch handler for a CLI application that just terminates your program, right? Like that's the only time I really like it. Uh, and so Zig really fulfills that. The the community, the ecosystem is pretty good. Docs are pretty good. So it is It is definitely poised to do something pretty amazing. I think Zig will win in Embedded if we can really get the right, you know, if we can get enough people working on it, which is kind of unfortunate that it takes a huge people, but or a huge amount of people to do that, and I'm not that person. But I think Zig will win ultimately because Zig is just easier to write. It's just the right, it's just the right thing, you know? Anyways. Personal thoughts, awesome. Links always in the description. I'm actually pretty excited about Zig. I still think Zig has a big future ahead of it. I just don't feel like Zig is there yet for me. OCaml is actually, I, I'm really excited about OCaml. I wrote yet another little thing in OCaml this morning. I'm very excited about that. Um, you know, I, I, I really, really want to see that. So, anywho, the name is the primogen.